Welcome to Cyber Shorts, a LinkedIn Live series brought to you by SecureWorks, where we talk about hot and trending topics in cybersecurity. Today, I'm excited to have Rafe Pilling back. He's our Vice President of Intelligence and part of our Counter Threat Unit, and myself, Stacey Ladwinger, the Vice President of Marketing. And today, we're going to talk about one of the observations the team has seen in the latest State of the Threat Report produced by SecureWorks, which really talks about how organizations and are being victimized by threat actors stealing credentials and cookie sessions using adversary-in-the-middle attacks. Now, Rafe, I think before we jump in, could you explain a little bit how does adversary-in-the-middle attacks really operate, and what does that look like for an organization? Yeah, absolutely. So... Everyone will be familiar with traditional phishing attacks. A threat actor sets up a, a fake looking website that looks like some service the user uses. It's their webmail service. It's the corporate remote access solution, whatever it might be. And they, they send links to the victim, the target. And hopefully for the threat actor, the, the target will click that link, go to the website, enter the username and password, and it gets captured by the threat actor. The adversary in the middle model takes that a step further. Rather than the threat actor having to create their own website uh, in order to, to trick the user and capture them, they set up a server which will, adversary in the middle, will be sitting in the middle of that communication flow between the user and a real service. So when the user clicks that link, they get redirected through the server and they get directed to the, the real site. They go through the authentication process, they enter their username, their password, Maybe they, they go through multi-factor authentication with an app or a, a challenge, whatever it might be. And then that, that session is authenticated and the, um, the service provides the user with a token to prove that they are then allowed to, to access that, that service on an ongoing basis. But the threat actor, because they're in that middle position with that, that proxy server they've created, they can then see that token and then reuse that token to access the, the user's account. So... Um, first of all, it, it does more than just capture usernames and passwords. Uh, it can be a bypass for multi-factor authentication, and it gives the threat actor that persistent access to the to the user's account without having to reuse the the username and password. So it's it's a very insidious form of uh, of credential phishing. And Rafe, as you said, this is really kind of taking those phishing attacks to the next level. So why do you? think that we're seeing such a prevalence around it? Is it because organizations have done a nice job getting multi-factor authentication and other models in place that they now need this next level of sophistication? I think that's absolutely right. So lots of organizations now have rolled out multi-factor authentication. Uh, there is a tier of threat actors. Some of them are state-sponsored. Some of them are uh, criminal actors that are using these adversary in the middle style phishing attacks in order to go after those organizations that, that have already uh, rolled out uh, multi-factor authentication in order to, uh, to compromise and gain access to those accounts. So, and we are far from advocating against using multi-factor authentication. It is a, a huge step forward in terms of defeating traditional phishing attacks, but obviously there's always this, this sort of cat and mouse game of attack and defense and threat actors evolve their tactics to respond to improvements in the control frameworks uh, of their targets. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. And then why are you really seeing then this on the rise? I guess we're seeing successful, are you seeing it more in targeted versus opportunistic, but what's driving the rise in outcomes from these threat actors using this tactic? So uh, I think one of the, the key factors is the ease of access to tools that will allow them to um, conduct these types of attacks. So there's a number of uh, frameworks that were originally created for uh, security testers, uh, red teamers, pen testers to use in order to try and get access to corporate accounts of the um, the companies that were employing them to test their security. But threat actors come in, take those tools and, and use them to, to attack victims uh, for real. There are also services available in underground markets, which make it easy for threat actors uh, with relatively limited skills to conduct these kind of attacks uh, against victims. And we're also seeing threat actors abusing legitimate technologies um, to, to create the same sort of man in the middle style uh, attack, uh, perhaps to fly under the radar a little bit because the, the interactions with the, um, authentic, the, the services look like legitimate interactions from a, a technology vendor, uh, but it's really a solution that the threat actors created to, uh, to steal uh, access tokens. 
And I guess then, you know, Rafe, as you talk about this, I'd like to break it into what organizations can do really in two parts, because we are seeing more of these type of attacks. So the first part is more on a defensive mechanism. How can organizations really detect if they have been victimized by this adversary in the middle type of attack? So uh, assuming that they are monitoring um, access attempts to to their accounts, there are a number of different things that you might see. So um, uh, access from an unusual IP address is one of them. Uh, if if the security system, security solution is tracking which IP addresses have previously been associated with that user's account, if they see a new one, they may log that or flag that as an anomaly. There is also impossible travel. Um, so if the, the user has just uh, authenticated from perhaps London and then um, very shortly afterwards, uh, there's a login from, say, Moscow. Uh, it's not possible for the user to get between those locations in the time available. That's uh, That triggers an impossible travel alert. And then we may also see additional uh, alerts triggered on some of the follow-on activities. So often we see these things leading to business email compromise style attacks, so threat actors getting access to mailboxes. They're looking for, they're usually maybe conducting searches for sensitive terms, looking for invoices or details about VPNs or perhaps files with uh, credentials and passwords in them. Um, they may also set up mail filtering rules that will uh, redirect or hide messages of certain kinds um, from the, 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 the legitimate owner of that mailbox. So those are all things that we as a security company uh, can, can look for or, or other uh, users, security teams can, can look for. And then I think on the other side of it is how do we actually prevent these type of attacks? So I, you know, I still think there's many organizations that need to still continue to push multi-factor authentication. I know we don't have that through every organization, but what can you do now to really prevent being attacked by this new type of threat vector? So yeah, absolutely. Uh, if you're rolling out MFA, continue with that. Um, but yeah, and if you have MFA, that's great. Lots of organizations um, that are considering this type of attack uh, are now looking at what's known as phishing resistant MFA. So, and it, and it seems like an odd term because the whole concept of multi-factor authentication was to defeat phishing attacks and to defeat uh, criminals getting hold of usernames and passwords from, from users. But phishing resistant goes that step further and doesn't, um, uh, when, when that token is, is created by the, the remote service, there's a layer of an additional layer of technology um, an additional layer of protection that makes sure that that token is associated specifically with the the user and the device that has initially conducted that authentication there's a lot of sort of complex technology that goes into doing this but the the key terms we're looking out for are phishing resistant mfa and the standards like fido2 so that's f i d o2 these are things that have been evolving for a long time, but have now gained a sufficient level of mainstream support in all the big technology vendors and platforms supporting them now. Um, so it makes it much easier for, for organizations to adopt these technologies. And as we are seeing this increasing volume of threat actors using adversary in the middle attacks, now really is the time to be exploring and, and looking at, at how what the migration path to, to this kind of phishing resistant MFA would be. And if you don't mind talking about the user experience, right? Because I think that's always been the resistance a little bit. Every security professional says it's easy, put MFA on it. I know even when I've had personal conversations, how can I protect myself, Stacey, for my bank account? All these things I say, use multi-factor authentication. They're like, yeah, but what's the next best thing? They're like the next best thing is MFA. What does this user experience look like with some of these new capabilities out there? So I think... Um... We all get sick of passwords. We all get sick of the advice of having to create either long or complex or sometimes long and complex passwords, um, a unique one for every every site. Now that is all good advice, but there are now layers of technology that um, remove the user from having to do some of that stuff. So things like on, on your mobile device, you might have sort of facial recognition, things like face ID, um, and they, they work with other technologies in the background to authenticate the user, to go through the authentication process at the, the lower layers of that communication stack, but without the user having to do anything more than say, look at their phone or place their thumbprint on a biometric pad. Similar for, for sort of um, the, the corporate environment, you get hardware tokens now um, that you can have plugged into your laptop and that that demonstrates that that's an authenticated device and then you have to take an action perhaps like um, putting your finger on the end of that token uh, in order to trigger a, a one-time password it means that the there's a lot of complex security under the covers but the user experience is really simple it's looking at a device it's touching a device whatever it might be uh, and, and removing the need to to remember lots of complex passwords 
That's great. And I, I think it's always important to know what we as security professionals can put in place to help prevent. But for that user, is there any advice on what should they be looking out for so that they don't become victimized from one of these attacks? I think we've all been trained more on the traditional phishing methods, but are there certain things that users should be aware of? Yeah. And I mean, this is where it gets difficult because the the original phishing attacks were already quite difficult to spot. And these ones where the user is actually getting taken through to the, the real service, so it looks exactly as it should, uh, can be even more difficult to spot. But again, it goes back to that. Um, think about the, the kind of initial interaction. So if you're, if you're receiving an email that's asking you to, to click a link or to, to open a file, and then that file has a link in it that says, oh, in order to view this um, uh, document, you have to sort of authenticate here and it'll take you through to whatever, Gmail, Google, Microsoft, uh, or um, uh, yeah, some, something like that. Think about the, the context and, and whether that's, that's normal for, for your organization. And if you're in any way unsure, you know, question it, raise it with your internal security team, ask them if it's safe, ask them if you, this should be expected. Um, but it's that, that sort of continual caution and curiosity around what you're being asked to do, particularly over email. I love that advice. I think we hear that often in any type of awareness training is always be curious. Just take that three seconds to question, share out and respond. Absolutely. Well, Rafe, I really appreciate you coming on today to talk a little bit more about the adversary in the middle attacks that we're seeing. And we are seeing this come up more and more. If anyone's interested in learning more, not only about the adversary in the middle, but other trends we're seeing, please do visit secureworks.com a copy of the annual State of the Threat Report is there. And then two, if you're looking for solutions that can help detect and respond to these type of attacks, that's what SecureWorks does every day for all of our customers who we're looking to protect and make sure that they can see more, detect better, and respond faster. Thank you, Rafe, and thanks for everyone who joined in today. Thank you, Stacey.